okay, now to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Jeff Gibson. Jeff is right here. He's a landscape business manager with Ball Horticultural Company, one of the largest horticultural companies in the US. And for over 25 years, Jeff has managed a range of Ball customer-focused sales and marketing activities. Currently, Jeff is focusing on Ball's steadily growing landscape business segment. And of course, in this role, Jeff works directly with landscape professionals and the greenhouse and nursery suppliers that serve them. He is a graduate of the University of Illinois with degrees in ornamental horticulture and advertising communications. Jeff has really good, excellent communication skills, and I think horticulture and communication skills really go well together. Jeff is a frequent traveler and speaker to professional landscape groups, growers, and municipal organizations, as well as community groups on landscape color trends, new varieties of animals, perennials, and flowering shrubs, and landscape care and installation practices. And today's Jeff's keynote is going to focus on why it's an exciting time to be in horticulture. Thank you, Jeff. Very good. Well, I'm happy to be here this morning. Thank you for the big welcome, Lika. I appreciate that a great deal. I was able to chat with a few of you this morning. As Lika explained, the official title is Landscape Business Manager for Ball Horticultural. It's essentially a marketing function, and I'll come back to that uh, on a couple of occasions when we get into a discussion on the professional landscape trade. But my mission today, especially for you students, in the crowd and some of us professionals is to give you an overview of what's happening at large within the horticulture industry as we know it today. So hopefully you'll find this information to be thought-provoking, insightful, and ultimately relate to us all needing to have a shift in our perspective. This is, this, this is, as I indicated, the, the intention is to get everybody to start thinking about things differently. And in that league, what I'll be talking about today are shifts in consumer preferences, the professional landscape trade, as I indicated earlier, the climate, as we know it today, and how that's affecting design aesthetics. As Lika indicated, this is ultimately about the integrated landscape, which is a big part of what we are involved in as a professional horticulture company. So that said, for those of you, especially the students, you might not have ever heard of Ball Horticultural Company. Let me talk about that for just a second. So we are a 110-year-old, 112-year-old company based out of Chicago that does this. We, uh, we are presently a third generation owned, and yes, the fourth generation is in the company working as we speak. Uh, the gentleman on the, on the left side of your screen is George Jacob Ball. He started the businesses at the turn of the century basically growing cut flowers. Those are actually asters that you see in the foreground there. That's what he got into. <laughs> and his, his granddaughter, Anna Ball, who's there on the right side of the screen, is our present day CEO and very much active in the business every single day. We are most known for serving growers, primarily greenhouse growers, because we're most commonly associated with annual flowers. Uh, but recently, we've gotten into a whole lot of other categories, which we'll talk about here next. You may also know us from some of our communications materials. Lika referenced the idea of the importance of communication, and we believe that firmly as a, as a corporation. So we are the group that published the Ball Red Book all those many years ago. This is actually the first copy of it in 1932, which was written by George Jacob Ball as, a, as basically as a reference guide for his fellow, his peers in the industry to understand how to grow cut flowers and annuals that were coming on. And this is the Ball Red Book. I don't know if this has appeared in any of your classes, but this is oftentimes a common reference for those that are involved in professional horticulture. So it's now a two-book two edition. Uh, the second part is entirely dedicated to machinery and technology, and uh, it continues through to today. We also have a magazine 
called Grower Talks, which we've had for many, many years, uh, that communicates directly to the professional greenhouse channel and uh, to the garden center sector, which is a big part of the audience that we serve. So marketing, production, distribution, all of those things. So at our core, at our core, we are a breeding, flower breeding, plant breeding company and distribution company. So we sell the inputs to growers. And it's probably best explained in this manner. So ball basically is sort of the dotted line and above, the breeder and producer and, and the distributor level. This is something that most ordinary consumers never ever think about, rarely think about uh, where plants come from. They, most consumers would just simply know that the plants are, come from the garden center. But there's a whole channel, up channel, that has to be engaged before that happens. So what we're most concerned with is, well, our group that's here in the room is probably independent garden centers, maybe uh, landscape professionals. I don't know if we have any representatives of the mass market here today, but this is the two interim steps that happen before you even get to the consumer. And we oftentimes have an argument within the company. I think I have my chart upside down because ultimately the reason why we're all in business is the consumer. And we think about that every single day in the work that we do. So we sell our inputs, as we call them, seedlings, plugs, unrooted cuttings. That's a term, might, it's basically, you're probably learning about it in your propagation classes. Liners, which is simply a unrooted cutting with roots on it. It's no longer unrooted. Uh, and then that goes on to the finished growers, which are your annual growers, your tropical growers, your perennial growers, trees, and shrubs. So that's, that's, this is where the production activity has, happens. This is where the sales activity has down here at this level. So that's more or less the horticulture channel as we know it. And there's a lot of iterations to that, but it, at its core, that's what we're on about. So let's start with shift in consumer perspectives, because as I said, as a company, we spend a great deal of time talking about that. So here's some stats for you. We love stats in our office, and a, a shout out to one of my peers inside Ball, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Marvin Miller. He's one of two, two industry statisticians that delve into the data that the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, produces on the floriculture industry. So some of this data is from Marvin. A good chunk of this data is from another group called the National Gardening Association, gardening.org, gardening.org. If you're a retail garden center, you definitely want to check out garden.org for the kind of information that they have. So I'm going to frame it this way. It's some, some pretty dire issues that I'm going to bring up here. But in those issues are opportunities. And as Lika referenced and Joe referenced earlier, in those opportunities are jobs. So at the end of the day, this is a big part of that. So they do an annual survey to consumers, about 5,000 consumers, every single year. And there was a really interesting thing that occurred in the last few years. In, as we all know, we've lived through the Great Depression at started de recession, depression that started somewhere in 2007, 2008 with the housing bubble and all of that and lasted well until 2013. We are out on the upside, outside part of that now. In 2013, this survey was done and uh, it's done in 13 and reported the following year. So in 2013, things were rosy, things were excellent. We saw the single biggest year rise in retail sales of lawn and garden uh, up 18%, which, uh, which amounted to an industry total of about $35 million of lawn and garden sales in 2013. Yay! That meant that we were coming out of the recession, or so we thought. Uh, the other thing that was really interesting is that we added more household. I'm going to use that term a lot. HH stands for household. So there's 84 million households in the United States that engage in some form of lawn and garden purchasing. And that, that amounts to about 70% of the households in the U.S., which is a significant number. And we added in 2013 1 million more households. Yay! Again, that means we got more people. So the 2014 survey told us a very different story. 
it told a story of a 23% decrease in overall lawn and garden sales. 23% decrease from 2013 to 2014, being reported in 2015. So we, as an industry, we're seeing a sales decline. Let me engage on that a little bit more. So right now, uh, so the number I reported before, so we were about $35 billion. It's down to about $26, $27 billion if you adjust for inflation. That over the course of the recession, that meant that we had about a 33%, a third, a third of our lawn and garden sales disappeared. And so a great many of the industry statisticians and a lot of you that are garden centers or will work in garden centers spent a lot of time fretting about this particular issue. Why? Why was this happening? Um, and, you know, a common culprit was to accuse the mass market. And then the recession hit. And the recession actually masked what was going on. And I'm going to get into that as we go along. So for, during that time period, um, the average annual spend a household spends on lawn gardening has dropped to 317. So 2013, again, 2013 was up. Yay! 20, uh, 2014 came in and the sales went down. Again, why? Another interesting statistic. So you know them as your prob you probably know them as your core shopping customer if you're in the garden center. For some of you in the room, this would be your parents or possibly even grandparents. They are the boomers, and they account for 51% of the sales. 51% of the sales in 2014. So we have a customer base that is graying in the lawn and garden industry. And that's not a terrible surprise to us because that's kind of been our core customer. And I'm going to get into that in just a little bit too. In 2009, those 55 years and older accounted for only 44%. Go back a few years, they were 30% and 20%. But now, they're 51% of those retail sales at lawn and garden. So it's a terribly important audience right now. All right, <clears throat> here it also delves into individual categories, which is inter interesting to look at too. Everything from lawn care to shrub care, flower gardening, et cetera, et cetera. Here is the nationwide, so how many households, so lawn care activities, Joe was referencing hiring the lawn service, uh, 55 million households, or 46% of households in the US are participating in some form of lawn care activities. Individually, that amounts to about 155 bucks per household, which is down. The, uh, the good news within all of this would be this number right here. This is our indoor house plants, which actually was a rising category in 2014 of 31 million households, or 26% of the population, and, it, and so, but they're still only spending 35 bucks. If you look at the bigger, what has historically been the bigger category, which is landscaping, so if your garden center is selling to landscapers or our landscapers, this is how many households, 34 million, 28% of the households in the US, and they're spending about 200 bucks or so, which has been down, it's down 33%. Okay, you're gonna be scratching your head at this point. What the heck is going on with all these numbers? Well, some of it does have, to, well, some of it has to do with where shoppers are shopping. And as much as we, as independent businesses, independent garden centers, as much as we malign the home centers and the mass market, they are increasingly a larger and larger percentage share of the market. So here's their market share. His, here's the number of households. So the vast majority of households in the United States are buying lawn and garden products from home centers, Depot and Lowe's. The, the independent garden center is third, sometimes a distant third. If you look in, in terms of market share, they are right here, 19%. So home centers and mass merchandisers. So Depot, Lowe's, and Walmart account for nearly 50% of the market. This is where people are shopping. And again, as an industry, we've talked about that again and again and again. Why are people shopping? In large part, they're shopping because one, it's convenient, they're everywhere. They outnumber you as a garden center. And two, 
they are presenting the product in a fashion that is appealing to, the, to all audiences. It's a convenience. And we used to malign the fact that their quality was bad and their service levels were bad. Well, that's all changed. They know that. They're in the business of that. So they've improved their game considerably. So that's the share, that's the number of households that are there that are going on. So the stark realities of Lawn and Garden today are these. So we've got our peak activity for Lawn and Gardening happened in 2005 with 91 million households. Remember, we're talking about 83 million households now. So the number of households has declined that are engaging in Lawn and Garden, the sport, so to speak. Uh, total Lawn and Garden sales peaked at about 40 billion. Remember, we're down about 25 billion. That's nationwide. Uh, the annual average household spend uh, is, was at a peak in 2002. So sales have been steadily declining per household. The amount of household participating, though, went up. And that has stayed consistent. So that's a bright spot that the number of households actually involved in the business of lawn and garden has gone up. And the spending has been down, as I indicated before. So households are up, and spending is down. Why? Well, this is some of it. So the baby boomers, which I've referenced a couple times now already, have increased their market share to the highest level ever, that 51% that I was talking about. There are core customers in the garden center sector right now, have been for a long time and still remain to be. The second line is really telling. The younger households have not continued their promising entry into the DIY market in 2013. Remember, I mentioned that 2013 numbers were, were through the roof. Everybody thought the recession was over. Great, we're back in business. As an industry, we collectively have been hoping for the recession to end and things would return to normal. Well, we got to shift our thinking. It's not coming back to the normal that we knew before, not at all. And it's largely due to this. We think the current gardening reflects cyclical maintenance, food gardening, and one-time projects. This is now our industry. So in 2013, as people were pulling out of the recession at a homeowner, you probably all did it yourselves if you own a home, you kept putting off projects after projects after projects. The recession cleared, maybe the income's a little better, maybe you're more secure in that knowledge, so you're gonna do that project. You're gonna put in that water garden, you're gonna put in that fence, you're gonna put in that garden that you put off for the last five years. That probably accounted largely for the spike that we saw in sales in 2013. But in 2014, it's a cyclical purchase. So in 2014, it went down. So that's what we suspect is also happening. But let's talk about the real elephant in the room. And this couldn't be a more appropriate photograph for what the elephant in the room actually is. No, it's not the elephant. It's the thing in front of the elephant. Discretionary income spending. Your competition is not Depot, Lowe's, and Walmart. Your competition is this, if you're in the lawn and garden industry. It's either your competition or it's your salvation. This is where it's going. And I, I'm an old dog, just like many of you in the room, and I'm thinking, oh, come on. It's not going to happen. It's totally going to happen, and it already is, and we're seeing the effects of it. So here's why. So middle-income families, your average Joe, you know, between 18 and 100,000, probably a little shy of that number, they've only seen a 0.2% income rise. That is top of the news. That is what Bernie Sanders and Hillary are talking about, 0.2% rise. It's flat for the most part, but spending per household has risen over that time frame 2.3%, making the same money, Spending more. What's going to happen? Well, you're going to spend less on certain things and you're going to spend more on others. So if they're spending more on, oh, let's say, or, well, they're spending less on landline phones. How many, house, how many folks in the room even have a landline phone? And every, well, two of the youngins in the room, everybody else, guess what? People aren't going to pay for it. If you've got to cut out an expense, you're going to cut out your landline phone. That's a common thing. That's happening. 
Clothes, people haven't been spending money on clothes. Appliances, it's kind of like the yard. You know, eh, I'll get by with the stove, I'll get by with the fridge, I'll, I'll get the parts that I need and you keep up with the appliances. So that's where some of the cuts have been made. But what's been being spent on are more pets. <laughs> I don't know, sorry. In, that, that should be in home dining. <laughs> the steak, oh. hypo. <laughs> Always proof your work. Sorry. Garden hoe dining, 23%. So people are eating at home. You know that staycation theme that we kept hearing about? Staycation? This is part of it. Uh, rent. So people are renting. Again, maybe they got out of the house. They're renting. Education, absolutely. We hear about it constantly in the news. All the debt, the educational debt that we have. So servicing that debt and health care. Again, a hot button issue within our political spectrum right now. So this is where money's going. This one was really interesting. So the pet ownership is at an all time high in the United States. Gardening, pet, pet. That's happening in large part. So gardening is suffering as a result of that. So sharing the, the, the soaring cost of digital, this is the other real competitor, that elephant in the room that I was talking about. So between 27, 2007 and 2013, cell phone spending went up nearly 50% and home internet, I can speak from personal experience, went up 81%, 81%. You used to have a box that had an antenna and you didn't pay, you paid for the box and not anymore. People are paying two, three hundred dollars a month on internet service, mobile platforms, digital, all things, because it is everything because it is everything in our life now. That's where the money's going. So more screen time for all of us. Sadly, the average American adult, 12 hours of screen time, five of it on a digital platform, a laptop, a mobile phone, what have you. And you know that relates to what we're seeing with our kids. We lament this issue, too, as a gardening industry. We've got to get kids outside more. We've got to get them engaged in the environment. Yes, we do, but you have, in reality, across the board, seven minutes of free time. Kids have got very structured time anymore. It doesn't allow a lot of time for just free play in the environment, which is, the, which is affecting our industry in a, in a most profound way. So the conclusion is, we used gardening used to be the number one hobby in the United States up until about 10, 15 years ago. Not anymore. It went from number one to way down on the list. So gardening isn't a priority. It's just simply not a priority. All right. <clears throat> going on. That's the gloom and doom part. The good news is we can fight back. So, and we know something about the people that shop our stores. So, and they can loosely be broken out by this. Again, this is the National Guardian Association. So if you look at the group, 32% are and garden enthusiasts. So typically these, this quadrant here, 7% of these folks and 32% of these folks, casual gardener, gardener enthusiasts, so we're, uh, this is a good chunk of the people that we can deal with. Then we have these reluctant gardeners. I love that term, reluctant gardener. Oh, I guess I got to go mow the lawn. Oh, I guess I got to plant the planter this year. That's a reluctant gardener. But they're a pretty significant portion. These guys just cut the grass. That's where all the lawn mowing comes in. So there's a big chunk of it. And this, sec so this sector is actually, actually growing. And the none of the above, they're just confused. They just don't know what they are. Master gardeners, which drive you crazy as a landscape professional or as a garden center, only make up 2% of our market, and they're getting fewer. Because guess what? This is also, this one, these two sectors, which is 7, 8, 9% of the total, is that 55 and over. Casual gardeners and reluctant gardeners, this is our next demigration, uh, demographics. This is our X's and our Y's. The cuts to the grass would probably be in that too. So we know a little bit about the people coming into our stores. We also know a little bit about human behavior. So there's a great book out if you're into statistics, Kenneth Gronbach, uh, How to Profit from the Coming Demo uh, uh, Demographic Storm, talks about two types of consumption. This is great stuff. So consistent consumption is stuff we need every single day, medicine, food, fuel, that's a consistent consumption over time. You just need it as a natural thing in life. 
Life cycle related stuff, changing uh, <clears throat> is where we're at. Changing priorities and life cycle related. Here's how it charts out. And this shouldn't be any surprise to us in garden centers sector for a long time. This is when things happen from age 33 to about 44. That's when people traditionally get into their first home. That's our core market, or historically has been. It has been, but we gotta shift our thinking again. That's kind of the point of this message. So right now, you know, our Ys, for the most part, are somewhere right about here now. And our Zs, yes, there's a generation Zs, are here and further back. So the Xers, of which I am one on the very late fringe, that was the generation that was most affected by the Great Recession. Because right at the time they would have left college, gotten jobs, and gotten a home, the whole thing went to heck, and they ended up back at home, or they rented, or remember that note about renting going up? They didn't do what they normally would do in the life cycle, which was get a house, get a yard, plant plants. So that affected us as a lawn and garden sector. And so it's all definitely, uh, definitely life cycle related. OK, back to our 55 and older that are 51% of our market, here they are. Here they are. All right? They're here. This is the group that is comprising the vast majority of our lawn and garden sales. So if you're not thinking as a garden retailer about this group that's yet to come and how to retain and frankly milk this group as much as you possibly can and also provide services for them different than what you've used to be doing, your garden center is going to be in a hurt. Because it, it's demographics. It's just numbers. It's just flat out the number of people that are available for the thing. So to that end, you have a little bit of a salvation in the American Horticulture Association, of which Ball is a big part. That is the National Association for Horticulture. American horticulture. It's a combination of the old American Nursery and Landscape Association matched with the OFA, the Ohio Florist Association, the largest two groups that talk about green, the green industry. American Hort commissioned a study utilizing uh, the Columbus College of Design, a group not unlike Johnson County Community College, students who helped them create a survey to get at that question. How do we understand our consumers? So they did interviews, they did videos, they sent people home with plants, they talked to students to get at what's on the mind of today's consumer. And incidentally, this is all available at AmericanHort.org shift. So it's called, literally called shift. That's the research project. It's fascinating stuff. And not surprisingly, what the public is telling us about our gardening sector is, first and foremost, language is scary. This is where we go on and on about us as an industry. We constantly talk about ourselves as an industry. We don't put ourselves on the other side of the bench. Remember this, that, that demographic curve? Remember those young people coming in? So using languages like Latin and talking about perennials and shrubs and is it, a, is it a deciduous tree? Ugh, that's all scary, and it puts people off. I know, it seems logical to us. Well, geez, I, I, that's, that's horticulture. Well, that's not how the public thinks. They think it's scary talk. And, oh, by the way, our 55 and older who's shopping in store probably doesn't identify herself as a gardener anymore. If you ask them, what are you, what are you here for today? What, what do you do? She might refer to, oh, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm a grandmother. I'm, I'm a retired person that likes plants. I'm, you know, they may not get to the word gardener. That's what this shift research has found out. And here's another real kind of common sense thing. Customers have distinct buying motivations. Duh. <laughs> and that's always been the case in every other sector of the economy. Every other retail thing is always about uh, buying motivations. And so what American Hort and their research is doing is suggesting to garden centers that they create, that they relate the individual motivations that drive plant ownership 
That's the reason why people come into your stores. Relate it to what they're calling personality profiles. It is advertising 101. And Kansas City is a hub for advertising. They do this day in and day out for all their clients. They identify a target market. They create a personality profile. They create their advertising and their promotions around that profile. We don't typically do that as a, as a group, unless it's retired Rona. So again, this is our 55 and older person that is a compromising 51% of our market at the time. But what, what, what American Horde is suggesting is that, especially as a garden center, that you get your staff together and create personality profiles for the customers that shop your store. Because every one of you that are engaged with the public, you know, you probably have a lot of the same repeat customers, and you know their wants and needs. They have very definitive wants and needs. It's the younger folks that are coming into your stores that you really need to work harder on identifying what their wants and needs are. And that's kind of what they're suggesting. So, so for her, for Rona, nostalgic memories, this is all uh, intrinsic motivations. This is all about, I like to garden, I want to get my grandkids into it, I want to be part of the community. It's social. As opposed to, here's our 18 to 34 year old uh, X or Y, and this is the guy we need, or we think we need. This would be the one-time purchase of a project. So Nate is all about in investing, curb appeal, keeping up with the Joneses. That's extrinsic motivation something outside themselves. He's moved into a new suburb that's just being built west of Kansas City. It's a huge HOA, and he has a little plot of land in the front yard, and he wants to do something special with it. He doesn't want it to look like everybody else's. That's a project. So you set yourself up around that concept. How are you going to keep him? Good and easy, efficient retail experience, uh, experience competitive prices, competitive uh, uh, knowledgeable staff. The thing that oftentimes, and he'll find you via Google search, Maybe a recommendation from the HOA he's in. And the crazy thing is uh, when he walks in the store, especially if it's a guy, a young guy, and you walk up to him, you've got to be really careful on how you ask the question because they never want to talk to you. That's why they love to shop Home Depot. You can go shop Home Depot and they leave you the heck alone until you really, really need something. And then you can't find anybody. But in a garden center, you're all over him. Like, what do you need today? And what kind of garden? Is it sun? Is it shade? Is it a perennial? What do you need? And Nate disappears and never comes back. And that's kind of what American Horde is talking about, is that you've got to create these personality profiles and recognize them when they come in your store. Here is Hipster Hannah and Granola Graham. I love this. <laughs> it fits. I know you have these people shopping your store. You do. They want to be unique. They're all about pollinators. They're all about bees. They're all about integrated landscapes. And they want to buy it. But they want to buy it as a package. They want to buy it as a project. And so what do you do? You send them out to the perennial area, and there's Asclepius over there. And there's, is it sun or shade? I don't know. They don't know. They don't know their, people don't know their own yards anymore because guess what? They work during the day and they never see their yard during the day. That's what a landscape professional knows. They, the first question, you know, we always do this. And landscapers do this too. Sun or shade? Oh. That's very common because <laughs> they're not there. So anyway, back to hipster Hannah and Graham, you know, you can definitely pull them in. And they are comprising an ever larger, increasing part of the market. This is our next generation. And they're very serious about it, and they will research it all online. And if you're not online, they're never going to find you. But guess who is online? People owes Walmart. Guess who is online? Retail stores. So they're going to end up there. Anyway, that's them. So American Hort, uh, the lady behind it all, Jen, um, uh, Jennifer, would be happy to send you the report if you want to just write that down. That is a really, really excellent research, piece of research, and it's ongoing. Any of you that come to cultivate in the summer, they'll have chapter two of this whole research. But anyway, the, 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 the point of it is that the industry is waking up to the fact that we cannot treat our customer base like we used to. All right, <clears throat> shifts in the professional landscape trade. Show of hands, how many is interested in landscape? 
fair showing of hands. Good. It's a great place to be, but it has some of its own issues. All, again, opportunities, starting with, I'll cover some statistics. It's a $76 billion sector of the industry. It's actually larger dollar-wise than Lawn and Garden because it sells service. That's the difference. Garden centers sell a thing. Well, arguably, they don't sell a thing anymore. They sell an experience. Professional landscape sells time, time mowing, time planting, time pruning, time mulching. That's the difference. So that accounts for the biggest dollars. The median income, and they're not large businesses for the most part. They're about 200,000 on average. They, they uh, uh, well over three quarters of them make less than a million bucks. There's, it's a nation of small professional landscapers. Uh, 467,000 of them, average growth about 2 or 4%. They're actually trending more towards the 4% now. So this is a sector of the economy that's doing well. Their most profitable and fastest growing is this, landscape maintenance. They do it for me. You've heard that term? As opposed to DIY, do it yourself, do it for me. This is do it for me. So this is where the lawn services are involved. This is where you know, tree planting happens. The single biggest issue that's affecting this group, now pay attention, is labor. Getting enough labor. That is a big deal. Labor to install and labor to manage. There is no single bigger issue affecting the professional landscape trade than this. Labor, labor, labor. Okay, so to that end, not, un, not, uh, not uh, surprisingly, consolidation happens in an industry that is comprised of a, lot of bunch, a bunch of small fragmented businesses. And this is exactly what's happened. So this, this guy on the left, Andrew Curran, is the president of a company called Brickman. And Brickman bought, this guy is the president, was the president of Valley Crest in California, East meets West. East meets West, largest landscape company in the world, a $2 billion landscape company, 20,000 employees. Their single, I was at their meeting when they got together, their single topic was recruiting and retention. It had nothing to do with the business of landscape. It was all about people, absolutely all about people. They have an army of people out trying to hire young professionals to get into the field of professional landscaping. They can't keep pace with the work that they get because they don't have enough labor. This is why Wall Street is interested suddenly in landscape because a whole bunch of small businesses, a lot of boomer owners, a contractually reoccurring income stream, that's dynamite. You get paid regularly because you've got contracts with clients and people wanting to sell. So if you read landscape magazines, half of it's dedicated to helping people sell their landscape businesses. So while our population is going up and the need for more professional services to maintain yards and businesses is going up, our amount of businesses is potentially going down, thus the consolidation. So, and this is driving, in the top 30, the top 30 make up about 30 to 40 million, uh, 30 to 40 billion of that 76, and Brightview is about five to seven percent, only five to seven percent as a two billion dollar company. That means there's still a whole lot of other companies out there that are that are making this work. So, and not, and not many of them are publicly traded, only two, and then there's a few ESOPs and whatnot in there. But a fascinating sector of the business. So what are they concerned with day to day? Does the things that are, des are driving design, clients, and budgets, that is the very top of mind thing that is on most clients' minds right now. Now the economy is responding somewhat. It's got a little sputter going on. We have kind of moved through all of the available inventory of built houses, and now new houses are being built. You're seeing it here in Kansas City. That drives new landscapes. So, but nevertheless, budgets are still tantamount to them getting the work. So it's, it's classically a low bid business in the landscape trade. Always has been and is increasingly more so. So the pencil's got to get sharper for most of the landscapers. The expectation, there is no room for error. 
As suppliers to the landscape trade, the common lament I hear around the country is they never give me enough time to plan. They never plan or plant. Right now, in February, nearly March, is when landscapers are turning over orders to growers for thousands of plants that needed to be planted by the grower three or four months ago, or planned. It's crazy, and it's only going to continue which has some ramifications on down the road. So this, because this idea of expectations, when a contract commercial client says, yep, I'm going to go with my $65,000 color install and fall install, go, plan it now. That's how it happens, and it's all happening right now. So this, this, and there's no room for error. They get the job or they don't get the job. And so it puts, puts the landscaper in the role of being an active purchaser for goods. And so they have people on their teams that do nothing but buy, or they should. Many of them don't, but some of them do. And those that know how to buy well are winning. Okay, the other thing that's affecting us as a nation is the growth of, uh, is the change in housing type. I'm gonna come back to this. HOAs, <laughs> there's that HOA again. In this case, it's Homeowners Association, and it's driving, driving, driving the landscape trade a lot. There, and homes are changing, so the big house on the sub big suburban lawn, that's maybe a relic from a bygone era. I mean, there's still a lot of that going on, but the next generation are thinking considerably different about the style. They want to be part of a community. They want a smaller footprint. And so that affects the amount of plants that get planted. Regulations, this is squarely where today's topic is. His regulations are driving the kinds of plants landscapers are using and the kinds of plants that growers are growing. And I'll come back to that. And lastly, Les Speck, I referenced it already. In general, the growers out there across the country are growing less speck. The economy, when it crashed, resulted in, on the nursery side, a whole bunch of trees and shrubs that got plowed under. They didn't necessarily replant. And now they're, now they're playing catch up, which if you're <laughs> supply and demand, if you're studying that, that's actually a good thing because the lower the supply, the higher the price. And that's exactly what should be going on. You should be raising your prices if you aren't because there's a lack of availability of shrub and nursery stock right now nationally, which is impacting the landscape trade profoundly. But greenhouse growers are doing it too. They don't grow a whole bunch of stuff on the hopes that a landscaper is going to show up and order it because they'll end up dumping it. And businesses cannot afford to dump product. That costs them huge monies on the bottom line. So there's less spec being grown. And what it's resulting in is a narrow and deep philosophy. This right there, friends, is the concept of dumbing down of the plant palette. Depot, Lowe's, and Walmart, they are all about narrow and uh, deep. So a, a simple range of products, but a whole bunch of it. So as a plant breeding company, that's a challenge for us to get in front of them with new items. But it also creates an opportunity. There is the alternative path. Smaller growers with specialization that grow different things are rising. So that's where the opportunity lies. And natives that Lika referenced, that's one of those opportunity areas, a big one. All right, so those are their, their dynamics. This, this is Carol. Carol, Shops Garden Center, she is that 55 and older. She also happens to be on the HOA board. And if you're a professional landscaper, you walk into a meeting, which is a, a board of citizens that are anointed with the business of running the HOA. They get to pick the plants. Carol could drive you nuts on an HOA board because she wants, she knows gardening well enough to be dangerous. <laughs> it's true. We love her in the garden center. We need Carol. Absolutely need her. But on an HOA board, it grinds the works. Nevertheless, 53 percent, 53 percent of the housing in the United States is in HOAs or about to be in an HOA. Property developers are building, building, building these big suburban areas, homes, could be townhomes, smaller units, but then it's turned over to the community to manage. 
It's a huge part of our economy, and, and it's growing. And, this, and also, incidentally, they comprise a good chunk of the footprint of the available land in the United States, which goes right back to what Lika was talking about, this integrated landscape, because they control a lot of land, if you've never thought about it. All right, the other issues with the, the landscape trade, and they've got many, E-Verify, there is nothing more important to the landscape trade, which by nature is a generally very conservative group. But on the issue of immigration, we have to have immigration reform. We have to have labor. It's, it's profoundly affecting our business. Every nurseryman in the United States, if you talk to them, they all agree. And E-Verify is the government's way of making sure that we're all that every worker is legitimate within businesses and the government is now checking. So that's an issue for landscapers. Prevailing wage, meaning people are getting paid what they should get paid, especially in urban centers. This is causing uh, costs to rise for the landscaper. Pesticides and safety have always been there, but the one I want to talk about today is water. Both protecting it, mostly from pesticides and things getting into it, and getting rid of it. So there's probably no bigger thing that's impacting the landscape trade than this. On the residential side, we call them rain gardens. Lika referenced it already. On the commercial side, we call them best management practices for stormwater management, BMPs. And so the industry is rapidly retooling to be able to deal with BMPs. Uh, so, and, that, and this is where our landscape is going. So we have rain gardens at the consumer level. We have biodetention levels at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the commercial level. And all of this, of course, results in an opportunity to sell plants. So the good news in all of this, even though oftentimes it's driven, this, how do I best describe it? It is a professionally driven design interest, mostly with landscape architects, that is being uh, serviced by kind of a cottage industry. That's where the natives thing comes in. And uh, we're gonna and we're gonna talk about that. The other speakers are gonna talk about that later today. So this is what the landscape is getting to be more and more like. California, Florida, Texas, Tennessee. There's a lot of color in there, but by the way, it's not necessarily annual color. So as an as a, as a company, we recognize that. And we're retooling as a, as a business at Ball. We just bought a rose company. We've been into perennials. Perennials is growing by 22% within Ball. Annuals are flat. That's a big concern for us. But we recognize that this is driving that trend. So shifts in the climate, whether you believe it or not, it, our atmosphere is warming, and it is absolutely affecting everything that we do as an industry. It's affecting the way that we develop plants, it's affecting the types of plants that are being specified on jobs. It's affecting the supply chain. It's affecting groundwater, how much water is being retained in the ground. And this is, this is really a telling chart. So the, here we are at 2015. You saw what happened over the course of, the, of nearly a century. So we have less available water on the land masses. It's heating up. So that's going to change the USDA chart for plant hardiness moved everything up by a zone. Pretty soon all our nurseries are going to be in Canada, if that's the case. But either way, the point of that is that you know these are the issues that we have to contend with. So in the landscape trade, if something works well, use the hell out of it. And use only that. So guess what? Ashes. Use them everywhere. And more lash borer. Boxwoods. Use them everywhere. Boxwood blight. Use impatience everywhere. Impatience down your mildew. Monocultures is the bane of the landscape trade. I promise you that begonias will eventually succumb to something. I don't know what it is, but it will. Maples, there's some indication that maples may be on the hit list. There's a number of pests that are affecting maples. And it's because of this. Everybody's heard the 5% uh, the, the rule. Municipalities are being held accountable to only put 5% of a particular species in, a, in the municipal landscape to avoid this very issue. So it's inspiring a whole bunch of new demand for the, for the nursery business, the tree business, which we hadn't seen before. So other issues that affect for the environment, natives versus non-natives, this will all be covered later today. But these are all very real issues that are affecting our professional landscape channel. 
So clients are increasingly interested in water and water conservation. They're using less water. Plants are being expected to last longer. They're looking to reduce, the, reduce their uh, water bills and certainly public visibility. So as things dry down, people start telling on their neighbors. It's happened in a profound way. Drought shaming, it's a web-based, an app-based way for the, a person to tattletale on their neighbor that's using too much water. And it's, it's, it affected water policies in Southern California. That's all going on. And we know that turf is a culprit. That's not the only culprit, but it's a big culprit. We survey this year after year, and this is where turf comes in. The turf guys are turning themselves inside and out to develop new strains of turf that are drought resistant. And we as a company are turning ourselves inside and out to come up with plants that are hardier, more persistent in the landscape, multi-season coloring, some oftentimes natively derived, oftentimes interspecific with native as a company. So, the design aesthetics are really where we're going next, and that's going to be a big topic today, inspired by places like the High Line in New York, the Lurie Garden in Chicago. You're starting to see that plants, again, over, interesting over time, flowers and foliage mixed together, perennials and annuals all planted at once and removed necessarily, grasses. This is all definitely what's hot in horticulture right now. You ask the landscape architects, this is the ASLA, the American Society of Landscape Architects. They say the number one thing that they are getting asked about are natives, followed by native adapt drought tolerant plants, followed by food and vegetable gardens. It's exactly what correlates exactly with what's happening at garden centers. This is what the LAs are saying. Uh, no, sorry, this is the nursery trade commenting back to Ball about why customers are using and here and this this is remember what I said earlier landscape architects are specifying integrated landscapes but it's a trade driven issue it's not a consumer issue here's the mass market retailers natives nah institutions nah municipalities some but it's definitely landscape maintenance followed by the restoration companies that and and uh, landscape architects that who is that is who is driving the interest in natives on a grand scale we hear about it a lot at the consumer level, but it's really happening at the municipal and government level. And this is why sustainable design is the thing and followed quick succession by stormwater control. So these are the landscapes. This is the front of ball, an annual company. We hired a guy named Roy Diblick in the last couple of years to convert the entire, get it out of the turf, get it out of the use, and convert it over into a sustainable landscape. Commercial businesses are aspiring to do more of that. Here's at the municipal level. Here's at the institutional level. This is the style of design that we're starting to see across the country. And why? You ask the growers, do they offer native plants? Yes. How much of it do they sell? Not a lot. That's what Lika was referencing in her forward note, that there's a big demand and not a lot of supply. If you're a grower or thinking about production horticulture, right there, well, those things cross, that's, that's the opportunity. So why are your customers looking for native plants? There you go. Bees and butterflies, water and drought, low maintenance. Hipster Hannah, Granola Graham at the garden center. It's also happening at the professional level. And the more it's done in the professional level, the more it'll influence the thinking of the consumer. So that's what's going on. So we are also engaged in that activity as well. So we've got a whole bunch of perennials. We have added a whole bunch of straight up native plant suppliers at Ball so people can buy native plants, regular natives. Granted, they're not ecotype specific natives. That's a whole debate amongst itself, but they are natives as well as cultivars. Functional plants that work in the environment, that are tested in all of our facilities to work in the environment. That's really what we're all about. So I'll close by saying there's a couple of opportunities coming up. We'll have a webinar on the color stuff next week if you're interested in that. Just go to uh, uh, balllandscape.com and balllandscape.com and you can register for it. We have a whole bunch of downloads and brochures and whatnot, uh, which I think should have arrived around here somewhere. With that, I'll say thank you. Thank you for your time. Any questions for Jeff? Yep. Yes, sir. That's correct. 
natively derived. <laughs> yeah, and that's where the debate lines are drawn generally. So the question is, the one that he sees in his pasture, Beaconish, is not the one that you saw on the screen. No, it's not. Not by a long stretch. That's right. So how do you live with that? Well, that's, that goes exactly back to this design aesthetic. There's a whole lot of proponents of this integrated design style, and I'm hoping that our speakers later today will talk about that. But there's, I feel there's going to be a, a rationalization. It's going to be an integrated landscape of natives that provide an, a natural function. Asclepius is a great example. If you plant Asclepius in the landscape to attract monarch butterflies, they're awesome at that, but they also eat the plant. They eat the leaves, and so now, you're, now your homeowner's looking at, what happened to my plant? It has, it's got bugs on it. You got to have the bug. You got to have the caterpillars to have the flower, to have the, the monarchs. You know, people just don't understand. So to your point, I think an integrated landscape of aesthetically pleasing items with the natives is where we're heading design-wise. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Some maybe yes and maybe no. That's so a big you area of debate. That's a variety, right? So how are, how are we going about the task? In the process of breeding, not every plant is bred so that it's, that it's sterile. A lot of them are. As an example, for instance, lantana, which is a great butterfly attractor, but it is also on the invasive species list in a lot of states. So in that case, we've gone after a sterile variety of lantana because it won't produce seed. That also happens to correlate with a flower that will last longer. That's one example. On the other side, we have a lot of butterfly and pollinator plants already in existence. Petunias, as an example. Petunias, oh, they're a great bee plant, especially the purple ones. We know that. We've researched it. We literally had an intern that sat and counted pollinators on various species. It was a whole intern project this summer. There's something to look forward to. So we're trying. We absolutely have that in mind when, when we're developing these new varieties. And it's pollinator friendly or, yeah. As an industry, we've yet to evolve to that. And we talk about that all the time. As, as a garden center, that's a huge opportunity. Remember what I was saying? Hipster Hannah and Granola Graham. You know, our tags are this big and they say height and spread and Latin name. They're terrible. They're horrible. Our tagging in our industry is just abysmal. Having a, you as a garden center can create your own tags. The whole, all the tag companies have print on demand technologies now. You can create a tag that relates to the issues that are of interest to your consumers. So if you've got, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to argue that, I'm going to ask you, do you have a pollinator plant collection in your garden center? Please, not organized by sun and shade necessarily, but it's all together. Because people are coming into the stores and asking for that, and they can't find it. You send them off to here, or you send them off to there, or that kind of thing. But it's a very, very real concern, and it's an opportunity, really. Yes, we have that. We actually have a lot of that online at the ballseed.com website. We have those lists. We can sort them so that you can pull up the plants. If you're a grower, you can actually sort them by the pollinator designation and pull up a list, and then it shows you all the suppliers of the plants that we have. So that's a good question. Any other questions? I don't want to take up too much time. I know we've got to get on to the next thing. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.